Hello there. there. Welcome back to episode 103 of Star Wars in the Galaxy, watching all the Star Wars we can get our hands on. This is season 13, episode 1 of Star Wars in the Galaxy. I'm Eli. I'm Jacob. And we have a great episode today. As promised, fucking finally, The Bad Batch season 2. We're doing it. Um, Long this waited. Is, this is the not only the most recent Star Wars we've covered on a galaxy ever, but it is the l- shortest amount of time we've waited since covering it. Right now, um, we are recording this. Um, we record on Sundays. Usually, it comes out the, the following Friday. Um, let me just check this because I'm pretty sure we have a fun coincidence. Yeah, it has been. exactly five months since the premiere came out exactly to the day um when we were recording this and how much time did we have for recording season one when did we start recording season one of the bad batch uh we did season one of the bad batch let's see i think it was around last year and it released in 2021 so i think it was over a year oh okay yeah yeah the last season of bad batch at least this is five months which yeah. breaks our usual in a galaxy cadence, which I I've said it in a galaxy cadence, um, said it in a galaxy cadence unofficially, which is that, um, and I think Jacob would generally agree with this. Like again, this is not a hard and fast rule or anything. It's just something I'd like to keep in mind, which is that we don't do stuff that's, um, that's that's newer than six months old. Yeah, yeah we're we making an exception say. for this. We're making an exception for this, but normally we won't do stuff that's that's less than six months old. So when we do the Bad Batch season three, it will be at least six months after it ends. We hope that's not going to happen with season two, but you know we'll we'll figure that out when we figure that out. Um, you know, eventually we will be doing Survivor, but it'll take us long enough that I think it will be a at least a year um, after the release of jedi survivor that's the newest thing that we're gonna get to um soon um also like vision stuff like visions volume two came out um actually literally a month ago now we're saying this we'll do the new visions shorts we promise probably not this year though because we want to wait at least six months um uh and that's kind of that's just how the way that way we do that we're not a new show no again no shade to we've said this million times no shade to those who are that's just not our style we like things yeah. to sit we like to, things to 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 marinate for a little bit um uh indeed i've watched this is now my third time watching the premiere um uh and i i found myself a little bit going okay yeah i, I want to get to the solitary clone not just because i like the episode better spoiler but because um i've only seen that episode i think once um and it was a while ago where whereas i've seen um the two part uh, premiere twice so it's a bit more in my memory i like it to get a bit uh, just a tiny bit hazy just so i can have some surprises in there for myself yeah um, i definitely had some surprises re-watching this things i didn't remember from watching it the first time even though it wasn't that even though it wasn't yeah. that long ago it felt like and i think definitely next episode um that, that i'm going to experience that because i remember generally what faster and try and tuned and tribe are about but like I don't remember a lot of the specifics. Like, I'm I, but so I'm I'm excited for that. But in the spoils of war, we open on a. Do we know this planet, Eli? Do we know the planet's name? I can. We do know the planet's name. I'm forgetting right now. I'm going to uh, to to look it up. Um, right now. Um, uh, I, I know the episode. It's not mentioned in the episode, but I do I do think it has a name. It is. Um, yeah, the crab heist, as it's officially called on Wikipedia. Um, <laughs> it's uh, yeah. No, I'm not. I'm not joking. Um, Ina Bonnie. Ina Bonnie is okay. the planet. Ina so Bonnie we on the tropical island world of Ina Bonnie. The Bad Batch are running away from giant crabs as they have retrieved whatever they are trying to retrieve hey, 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 hey. <laughs> space crabs like get it right sorry, space, space crabs sorry sorry space crabs 
the running that's not their giant. official name that's... i'm just calling the space crab because i was so hyped <laughs> when i saw this in the trailer yeah. and i remember specifically getting hyped like the few days before because space crabs well that's star wars anything can be space so you're right yes they're running away from these giant space crabs um there's so there's some hijinks in a nutshell um Omega is dangling from the end of a giant rope off the Marauder, their ship at one point. Um, they do make it. They make it back to Lord Mantell, and they make it back to Sid's. They make it back to Sid's tavern, um, where they meet. Uh, they meet Fijanoa. Um, they meet the pirate Fijanoa, who has intel about Dooku's war chest. Now that Count Dooku is dead, um, the the Empire has taken over. Um, Dooku's homeworld of Sereno, and they are uh, they are plundering his war chest, all the uh, assets and wealth that he had built up, I guess, in his uh, in his castle. Um, you know the you know Count Dooku's palace, you know, as seen in the Clone Wars. Um, so Hunter actually nixes going there to steal part of the war chest. Um, however, Sid convinces the rest of the Bad Batch. Um, that the war chest is worth going after because it is so valuable that bringing some of it home would be enough to buy their freedom, buy, buy them out of debt with Sid and give them enough money to disappear and be able to live without being on the run. So Hunter begrudgingly agrees and they set off. They set off for Sereno. Um, they, they make it all the way to the, they make it all the way to the Count's palace and, um, However, this is where things this is where things go sideways because while while Echo, Tech, and Omega make it onto one of these containers with this there's this giant there are these giant container haulers that are taking off with many kind of yeah, many many big containers that kind of attach and detach, like the ones in Star Wars Rebels. I get like, people know what we're talking about this time. Um Space U hauls. Yeah, space U. <laughs> yeah, a, a bunch of space, a bunch of space U hauls or space container ships. Class and, four freighters. I remember she yeah, said class answer. four freighters. I don't. I've never heard that before. But basically, the ship takes off with Omega Wrecker. Sorry, not Wrecker. With Omega, Omega Tech, Tech and Echo. Yeah, Omega, Omega Tech and Echo are on board, um, and Wrecker and. <laughs> hunter are left behind um they're left behind on sereno um and they have to fight their way back they're left to fight their way back to the marauder meanwhile um the ship is taking off and they need to get off it before it jumps to hyperspace so they can reconvene with the other knowing that there's hostiles on board the captain of the of this freighter jettisons all the escape pods so they can't escape so they actually jetten all the cargo, all 50 of the cargo containers with them in it, knowing that the re-entry thrusters will hopefully uh, slow their fall. And that's where it so ends on a almost literal cliffhanger with them in a giant container falling through the upper atmosphere of Sereno. Picking up right where we left off in Ruins of War, um, their uh, container ship, or the, the, the container that omega tech and echo are in crashes and crash lands and during the crash landing tech um during the crash landing tech breaks his leg unfortunately as they are escaping from the um as they are escaping from their uh from their container they meet a a, a resident of sereno an old man named romar um and they they kind of force Romar to take them to his house for shelter um, where they get to know Romar and they realize that he is he is a, a fugitive of the empire and he is he is uh, living in this house out in the middle of nowhere in the in a in a remote part of the Sereno forest um, along with other fugitives who escaped the empire's orbital bombardment oh yeah that's right we also see that the Empire um, pretty much orbitally bombarded to rubble. They bombarded Sereno's capital city next to Dooku's palace pretty much to rubble. Um, and so he has escaped from that and he's living with some other 
fugitives and and, and refugees and whatnot. Um, so they're all hanging out there. They get to talking with Romar. Romar reveals that Dooku exploited Sereno to fund the war chest and his own personal wealth. Tech and Echo get into more of a debate about um, about you know what to do with the war chest. Should they go back for it? Should they just leave? Would they be better off? You know, we'll, we'll get to all that. Um, meanwhile, meanwhile, uh, Wrecker and Hunter are fighting their way. Uh, they, they're fighting their way through intense battle after intense battle to try and get back to the Marauder. Um, however, things things take a turn for the worse when, um, who is it? Sorry, I'm uh, sorry. I'm, I'm <laughs> there's a lot of names I'm trying to keep track of. I'm 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 blanking right now. Um, Omega, Omega decides that she has to go back to get some of the war chests to make sure that they don't leave empty-handed. So Omega is rappelling down this. Omega rappels down this cliff to get into the crashed container, their crashed container. Um, and uh, Echo goes after her to try and bring her back. Um, and so does Tech. However, uh, they're cornered by um, the Imperial, by the Imperial troops, by the clones. Um, and Echo, sorry, Tech, fights off the clones um while echo tries to convince omega to to leave the uh to leave the spoils behind eventually um romar comes romar comes to the rescue and he helps rescue tech and help pull and helps pull them out of the um pull them out of the uh of the container as the empire closes in and then the um also the uh the marauder comes to the rescue as well because hunter and sorry name fatigue first time talking about this in a while forgive me hunter and wrecker have gone back to the marauder they come to the rescue as well and that is that oh yeah and then back on um back on uh, after after everything settles down we have one final scene um where uh, uh we we see admiral rampart admiral rampart arrives on sereno and he's talking to the clone sergeant who is in charge of um tracking down the jettisoned containers and trying to capture trying to capture the bad batch um and he murders his own uh he murders his own sergeant shoots him off a cliff because the sergeant refuses to falsify the report to omit any mention of the Bad Batch, since Rampart is afraid that mentioning the Bad Batch would reflect poorly on him, since he already told his superiors that the Bad Batch had perished during the fall of Camino in last season's finale. And that that is really all there is. That is it. That is that is all there is for the two-part uh, premiere. In the Solitary Clone, the Solitary Clone does not feature any uh, members of the current iteration of the Bad Batch at all. Instead, it focuses on former member Crosshair um, as he is recuperating uh, at, at an Imperial base on Coruscant. It's revealed that he had been stranded on that Kaminoan platform for 32 rotations before the Empire wow. eventually uh, picked him up. Uh, he reports into Admiral Rampart's office um, Admiral Rampart assigned him to Commander Cody's mission to the planet Desix. Crosshair reunites with his old friend Cody um, to uh, resolve a, a conflict on the planet of Desix. Um, Imperial Governor Groton, who they had assigned to um, watch over the Desix system, had been captured by the forces of then Governor of uh, Desix, Tawny Ames, who is a former separatist. Um, because she, because Desix um, is an independent system and she doesn't want any in imperial interference. Um, obviously, the Empire doesn't like that very much, and so they send Crosshair and Cody uh, and their squad in, I, I assume part of the 212th, um, as, under the guise of a peacekeeping mission, when really it's just to capture and kill, if necessary, Governor Ames and remove her from power. Um, there are they engage in a full scale Clone Wars esque battle against battle droids. Um, she has quite a bit of uh, the Separatist Armada at her side. Battle B one battle droids, commando droids, 
and Droidica's among them. Uh, eventually, however, they get to the throne room where Cody convinces, uh, where Cody has a change of heart uh, and tries to resolve the conflict peacefully. Um, Ames is convinced to let um, Groton go, only for Crosshair to execute her in cold blood. Um, he goes back to the Imperial base on Coruscant, mission successful, um, but uh, and um, Rampart soon assigns him to another mission, and he goes, what happened to Commander Cody? And it's revealed that Cody went AWOL after the mission, uh, choosing to uh, uh, choosing uh, I guess something else we don't know yet what um, over his life as a trooper in the Empire, uh, and that's the solitary clone. Um, let's get to the let's get to spoils of war first. Spoils of war first, or or I, I let's get to our two parter first. I like like yeah, they're named different things, but to me they are the same story, and I feel oh, like yeah, we should totally just cool. talk about the first two, um, which is just a really interesting. We have some really interesting stuff here. Um, Space crabs. We start with space, space crabs. crabs on on yes. on Ina Bonnie. Um, I was so excited for space crabs, and it was just a fun little adventure, very much like one of those beginning of an Indiana Jones um, movie. And believe me, the comparisons to Indiana Jones are not going to cease here. Um, you'll oh, probably hear me re um, referencing Indiana Jones on the show very much in the coming um, in the coming weeks um, for a few reasons. First of all, um, this episode specifically, and another this season, Entombed, remind me very much of Indiana Jones and have a lot of references to the series. I am a huge fan of Indiana Jones. That's the first reason. Second reason is I just recently rewatched um, Indiana Jones and the King of the Crystal Skull, um, in, uh, and I liked it a lot more than I did the first time. And um, it's just put me in a very Indiana Jones mood. And third, obviously, the other reason is at the end of this month, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny is coming out, which is our big Lucasfilm film release uh, this year. And I'm so excited to see the final chapter um, of this story, which I love so much. Uh, and yeah, I will be referencing Indiana Jones a lot. Um, it's a fair warning. But it, it feels like the... Um, the beginning of an Indiana Jones movie where you catch up with Indy on some adventure um, just to catch you up with how he's doing and how he's viewing the world right now. And that's exactly what we're doing with the batch. Um, Omega's training with the vehicles. Uh, she's studying with the vehicles. Um, Hunter, Wrecker, and Echo are off doing something when they get chased by crabs. Um, Wrecker, of course, woke, woke the crabs um, because, of course, he did because that's Wrecker. Um... And, uh, yeah, the, the, it, it's just a fun time. Uh, it, it is just a really fun time. Um, and I remember also, um, just talking about the beginning, I remember watching this for the first time and being so disappointed and, and being disappointed with this throughout the season. Um, and we'll talk about where that will eventually get them when we get to those other episodes. But they're still working for Sid. Yeah. I had really thought after season one that they would have abandoned that. I really thought that after stuff that happened in with, with like later in the season with the Ryloth stuff and how much that changed them and with Infested and how much of a shit show they had to go through basically for Sid and only Sid. Um, I thought that they would realize that Sid wasn't really a viable option for their own safeties anymore. Yeah, I think, yeah, it is kind of mystifying watching this again. Why are they still operating with Sid? And presumably it's because, you know, she kind of, she already makes it clear that she she kind of is willing to, to turn them in, I guess. I, I think it's really do, about, for me, I feel like, I feel I it's that, about comfort. That's the implication. I think it's about comfort. I think yeah. that, you know, they they found a groove working for Sid, and even if it's not perfect, they'll take it over not knowing what to do. Yeah, that's true. And it's a way to make money for them as well. They need to make a yeah. living. You know, they need to yeah. survive. They don't have a lot of options. Mainly yeah. it's other. Yeah, by any other name, it's really just a lack of options for them. Yeah, and yeah. And there's this, um, this other, um, and that brings us to one of the main conflicts of this episode, and 
to one of the major improvements I think that the Bad Batch season two made over season one. I remember a lot of fans complaining about the lack of character development for the lesser, so quote unquote, lesser members of the Bad Batch, specifically Tech and Echo. And that was a great this, that I had as well. Um, this is this season delivers on, I believe, both of those in droves. Um, this episode very much is an Echo development episode. Um, where we see that Echo, and I think this is this is where I would take the character too, and I think this makes the most sense for the character, for Echo to be the moral center of the group. Not that the others are immoral in any way, but I feel like Echo is their moral compass, um, in a very w- real way. Well, yeah, he has um, some very he has some very interesting perspectives in this uh, in this episode. He has more of the um. I think I think his perspective is informed by the fact that he was originally a regular clone and went through much more of the Clone Wars, and for, that he, and, and that he was that. taught by Anakin, Ahsoka, and Rex, who yeah, all I, had very very informed moral cores. Yeah, well, their moral core of kind of if something's wrong, exhaust exhaust every possibility to make it right, no matter what. And then we see, obviously, Hunter. Uh, has a very as we'll get to as as we discuss hunter has a very different what's guiding what's guiding hunter what hunter's priorities are very different we talk about he talks about wanting to disappear wanting to give omega a safe peaceful life you know yeah um because he, he that's why he mixes the um the sereno mission at first as he says you know look We've been off the Empire's radar since Camino. Why do we need to? Why do we need to start with this again? Why do we need to go through all this again? Um, yeah. But I, I mean, I guess we should get to that scene in the Sid voting part because to me, that's the most Im- of all this epi- of all of of all of these episodes. I think this is kind of the most important moment, at least in terms of setting up. The way that it sets up the rest of the season, it sets up all the, or it sets up a lot of the themes and questions and conflicts that really inform this season uh, and yeah. carry over from season one as well. That really inform this season. You know, Hunter obviously, he wants to disappear. He wants Omega to have a a safe, peaceful life. Echo thinks they should be doing more. Echo thinks yeah. they should be back out in the fight. They should use Dooku's war chest for good. Behind that, all we have Sid kind of pulling the strings to to um you know and it's pretty clear that she's kind of she's pretty manipulative and and as much love for the batch as she seems to have at times she she is not afraid to to kind of use them for profit and for her own ends and she will play she will play very very hardball in order to make that happen and keep the money flowing for her from the batch going out and doing what she wants them to do yeah we see and and this is very similar to season one but i think in a lot of interesting more developing ways we see this yeah we see we see um in season two you know these first three i mean the the first the premiere is is very much uh a mission they're doing for the money um and like and 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 like a not and, and maybe a little adverse to, so more looking towards hunter uh and yep. his goals rather than echoes solitary clones across hair episodes so that's kind of so so that serves a different purpose faster which is four which we'll cover next time and entombed which we'll also cover next time are very much hunter's goals tribe is more echoes goals Clone conspiracy and truth and consequences is also more Echo. Then they break off. Then then Echo spoiler um, leaves the crew temporarily, and they do crossing. They do the crossing retrieval, um, which are kind of hunter more hunter focused goals. And um, then they do. Then we do the outpost, which is back to crosshair. Then we do Hob. No. Then we do metamorphosis, which is even without Echo a more Echo focused episode um then we do pabu which is more hunter and then we wrap up the season which with stuff that's way more echo focused um with with these two clashing ideologies um so it's it is very much like 
And I think we're meant to agree with Echo. To a certain extent, I, meant, I think we are meant to agree with Echo. And I do agree with e Echo. But I also think it's not that simple. I think that Hunter has a point. I think that Hunter wants this kid to be safe. And I think the reasons he wants her to be safe, uh, 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 that, you know, there is this genuine love between all of the Batch and Omega, and that she is yeah. a future, and that she, it, 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 she's a future leader, and sh and they see how she can rally people to fight against the Empire. I think that, 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 that I think that protecting her to a certain extent is actually not a bad goal. I just think that at the end of the day, Hunter might be letting his fear control him a bit too much. Um, because we know that Omega can handle herself. That's what a lot of season one was about. Uh, and you know when it when it's um when 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 it comes down to it in season two, you know it's not like they're having Omega stay behind the ship most of the time. They're not doing that at all. Yeah, you know. She goes on with this mission with them one hundred percent. Yeah, but I mean, I, at the same time, I do understand Hunter's perspective because you know we we went through everything that we did in season one to get to this point where she is more accepted as you know part of the Bad Batch as someone who can contribute. But at the end of the day, she still is a kid. She is a literal child. Yeah. Um, no, ma no matter how skilled and precocious she may be, I do think Hunter is certainly not certainly not wrong to say, wait a minute, hold up, we need to do things. We well, need to do a certain way, and we need to make certain considerations because we're trying to raise a child. We're trying to raise a kid. We're her parents, basically. Um, and I know Star Wars also, you know, at the end of the day, you know, it's 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 fiction, especially you know, this is a, it's a kid's show, you know, there's, there's got to be kids in there. And at the end of the day, it's not like, kind of what we were talking about with Andy. Yeah, absolutely. A couple weeks ago, you know, the, the rules, the rules are a little bit different, but I do kids, still yeah. appreciate that Hunter is making those considerations. And I don't think he's entirely, I don't think he's wrong. I'll say that. Yeah. And that actually leads to a, uh, another point I was going to make about um, Bad Batch season two, which actually is interesting that it that, that we're also looking at it around um, Jedi Survivor two, just the time that it takes place, because it will likely lead me to a quote from that. And um, I got to show Jacob a little bit of that game um, a few days ago. Um, and one line that you saw, I remember very beginning on Coruscant, Senator Sajin says it to Cal. Um, and it's this enduring question that that fuels not only Survivor, but many Star Wars projects. Why fight when you when you know you can't win? And it's not that I don't think the batch can win. It's that you know very much. And and this is there's this is one way of looking at Star Wars projects. I'm not saying this is the only way. And I'm not saying that every single Star Wars project can be boiled down to this. But there is an idea that I have, and that I think a lot of people have of viewing Star Wars projects through the original trilogy. You're either a New Hope, you're an Empire, or you're a Return of the Jedi. What and do you mean this that? year, um, just about the three parts of the hero's journey, about the three, like, and about the three parts of a trilogy, since Star Wars does like to do things in trilogies um, a lot of the time, and I think it works especially for both Bad Batch and the Jedi games, because we know both of those things are going to be trilogy. We know there are going to be three seasons of the Bad Batch, and we know that there are going to be three uh, three games in the Jedi series. Um, and Bad Batch Season 2 and Survivor have the same position in both of them. They're the empires. Um, so the end is not in sight. We, you don't, they don't know that they're going to win. It's not like, you know, I'm not saying that Luke and the others knew they were going to win in Return of the Jedi, but, like, the chips were all on the table. The Emperor and Darth Vader were, were both going to be on the second Death Star. This was the final push to deal a huge blow to the Empire. And while it didn't completely defeat them, that as we know, Battle of Jakku happens a year later and defeats them, it marks a turning point in the war. 
in the Empire Strikes Back, they didn't really know that. They didn't know after Hoth, like, like they were worried about the rebellion, but like the rebellion was still out there. Like it was a crippling blow to the rebellion. Don't get me wrong, but they were still out there, even though they were, e- even mm-hmm. though stuff was in jeopardy. Yeah. Okay. And Bad Batch season two very much is the empire of the Bad Batch trilogy of of seasons in this case. And, you know, we have this, and, you know, how do you survive? You know, we've gotten our new hope. We've gotten the team together. We've gotten the, we've gotten the uh, hero of the hero's journey. In yeah. my mind, I think the hero of this one is Omega. Um, but, you know, you can make the arguments for other people too. Um, yeah. You, you, you have, you have the, the hero and their team together. And now, and 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 they they've proven that they can fight good against whatever the opposing forces. In this case, the Empire. Yeah. But now it's a question of how they fight, and when's the fighting going to be enough, and what's their end goal that they're reaching. Um, and you're you're starting to ask all these long term questions. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, like 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 you do in um in season two um and very much you know like you said it's it's about what is their long-term goals very much i feel like season one was about what are their short-term goals this is about what are their long-term goals and i think as you see the season drift on mostly you'll see and especially of course as we get to the end of the season and again i'm saying spoiler because you know the finale only came out a few months ago, but you know, if you were listening to this, I assume you've seen the whole season. But approaching Sid's betrayal, you know, I think they are going more towards Echo's path. I think they're going more towards the path of helping people. And yeah, they're, using they're their squad the skill. Rejoining rejoining the fight, albeit, you know, more cautiously and kind of on their own terms. I would yeah. say. Is, and, and that's and, kind of the, the season is they don't entirely want to just disappear off the map, but they also don't entirely want to just become full-time soldiers trying to fight the Empire, but they need to figure out for themselves you know, what they what they stand for, you know, what is their MO kind of going forward, I would say. I would say. Yeah, and how do they operate, when do they operate, when do they not? Um, and this episode, as we're saying, um, I think we probably should go down to Sereno now, I feel like this episode is so interesting because they had it. They had the opportunity to escape. They had the opportunity to get away from it all. They had that opportunity. And of course, things went south for them very quickly. But without a second's hesitation on anybody's part except for Omega. But like, I'm, I'm talking about like the, like Hunter and Echo, who are the leaders of their respective missions once they split apart. Neither Hunter nor Echo thinks for a second about the treasure once things are going sideways for them. Yeah, it's all about it's all about the family, the crew. It, they give it up instantly. Yeah. They give up literally something that could have prevented the entire rest of the season from happening instantly. And that I think is the is is the defining choice of this. And and this is another thing. Like I remember watching this, and I'm like, you know, these two were really great episodes, and I really feel reacquainted with the Bad Batch. But why was this the premiere? And now I get it. I mm-hmm. get why this was the premiere. This was the premiere to show them making the choice that would impact the rest of this season. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. The rest of the season, in my mind, does not happen nearly the same way if they do get that treasure. Yeah, absolutely not. Because, yeah. and as we'll talk about, the treasure was the easy way out. Yeah. The, the and, of, and we'll draw our Indiana Jones parallels here too um, with the scene from Last Crusade, but, you know, y- yeah, the treasure was the easy way out and 
they, yeah, and that and that would have set them on a vastly different path. Um, I've been talking a lot though. Um, where do you want to go next on Serrano? And I don't know. I think um, I like I, I liked Serrano a lot. First off, it was great to see Count Duke's Castle. See how big it actually is. I thought yeah. that was cool to see it just kind of put put into perspective a little bit more especially since we just last week we were just discussing of all things the count dooku episodes of tales of the jedi so this kind we of really did that well unintentionally didn't we yeah definitely we really did the what we like we we did three shorts about count dooku um explicitly about count dooku and then i yeah. feel like we did three episodes today that were all implicitly about count dooku yeah, um, or they, they they lended they lended themselves to fleshing fleshing out his story a little bit more yeah. in, in kind of minor world building kind of ways, but nevertheless, yeah. I think um, I really liked seeing the scenes of um, Hunter and Wrecker, you know, running through running through the city, or of the batch, yeah. you know, seeing the um, seeing the bombarded out. Seeing well, let's talk about the bombardment because I love yeah. that they mentioned this specifically because they bombard overly bombarded Sereno. What yeah. other planet did they do that to? That they uh, mentioned Camino. Um, yeah, Camino. The, planet, probably. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it was the other planets, but they specifically mentioned Camino, and I love that just because juxtaposition. We have the home world of the separatist leader who was the enemy of the republic and then yeah. we have the home world of the army that was literally protecting the republic from that evil yeah and both of them get the same fate i think it kind of it's really about kind of the the empire i mean obviously it, it's I think the empire kind of it's a reflection of the emperor's fear of the truth coming out and trying to basically bury the truth alive or kill yeah. the, basically kill the truth and bury it in the rubble. And I would also say I compared it to um, the Battlefront 2 campaign, um, weirdly enough, where, you know, you have a planet, ironically enough, even though it is the emperor's homeworld um, originally. You know, Naboo was a very, very um, anti-imperial planet. Yeah. Um, and that was one of the targets for Operation Cinder. Um, but you know what it was also one of the targets for Operation Cinder? Vardos, which, as we know, was a very pro-imperial planet. That's where the Versios yeah. came from, uh, as well as many others who are very pro-imperial and yet they also get uh, and and operation cinder um gets foiled by um inferno squad on naboo it doesn't on vardos because they're still working for the empire at that point but the point is they were ready to do the same things to two planets who felt vastly different around the empire and it uh, about the empire and it tells me one thing that the empire doesn't care yeah at the end of the day nobody's safe that's the empire's it, the the end of the day they're all assets yeah that it's it's not like it, uh, connecting to the solitary clone which we'll talk about in its own right you know <laughs> and um and he quickly covers it up but look at rampart's face when he looks at crosshair and goes you stayed 32 rotations um on camino yeah it's this shock because loyalty doesn't exist on the dark side it doesn't exist in the Empire. It's just like... Yeah. Well, I thought Rampart was kind of... I thought Rampart was kind of trying to mock Crosshair a little bit. That's what I thought he was doing. Because, I mean, clearly Rampart... I mean, I feel like it was just like a disbelief thing. I'm Like, he couldn't yeah. possibly understand why somebody would do that. Yeah. Because, again, it's not... Because, because the Empire is not about loyalty. Um, and it went, and it never was, and it never will be. Um, that's yeah. what I, that, that, that's what I took away from this is, is the empire won't treat you any differently, whether you're for them or against them. 
because you are at the end of the day an asset and they will use you for as long as they need to and then they will throw you away which is actually ironically kind of crosshairs arc in this season yeah kind of um uh, i think also though i don't know we, we can discuss that when it happens but there also is an element in the empire it does depend on a certain amount of of fanaticism and and people who are true believers to kind of keep the cogs turning in a way and it's it's yeah. very it's very debatable you know who who is and isn't a true believer what does that mean but i think when we when we look at people like um when we look at people like rampart part of the thing is there's this sort of cognitive dissonance or maybe it's not even maybe it's not even cognitive dissonance maybe it maybe it lines up in this weird way they there is belief i think based on based on rampart based on the words and actions of rampart um as we'll get to um governor uh what's his name Rotten. the governor groton yeah people like there is a certain belief in the empire's mission in the empire's values in what the empire is and what the empire stands for like people really do believe in it but at the same time they're very people the bureauc the bureaucracy you know people in the military the political structures are also very selfish and very convinced that they can kind of kind of game the system or rather kind of kind of um get in a better position for themselves at others expenses kind of within the system not realizing that that is the system is it's the the empire the emperor's idea of like you know the, the idea of like sharpening the blade and, and 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 culling the weak and all that which is why there's so much backstabbing because there's no actual loyalty but there also is you know what i mean like, yeah, there's, there's a loyalty to the cause but there is it's not a loyalty a paradox of the um there's loyalty kind of... but there's no camaraderie there's loyalty to the cause but there's no camaraderie there's no it, it you're you're never working with somebody because you like to work with them yeah well to be loyal to the empire is kind of almost it's almost kind of like to be loyal it's just being loyal to yourself in a way Abs yeah absolutely if you know um, what I guess you could yeah. say and, it, and it's really easy to fake that, too. I will say that. I don't think Rampart's actually that loyal to the Empire. Like, yeah, to the ideas. I, I, I think he's loyal to the Empire because they give him power. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I think it's debatable. I think we see instances yeah. where you might be able to say the other thing. I, again, I don't know. It's, it's debatable, yeah. Yeah. But, I mean... Yeah, but let's let's go to let, let let let's go on to um let's go on to what we find on Sereno. Um now let me let me talk to you about something. Let's see. A ruthless tyrant robbing his own people um of uh of their fortunes and funds for his own gain while doing the same for all of the other worlds that his um rebellion conquered and plundered that sounds like a villain from one of the tales of the jedi dude who sent her shorts doesn't it not yeah does it not and now it's dooku but now it's dooku himself he has no, become what? the very thing he swore to destroy <laughs> yeah, what is, um, what is he a corruption like yours must be exterminated from the eradicated galaxy. yeah eradicated yep and Maybe. look and, and look where his corruption got him his own corruption got him exactly yeah. to there <laughs> yeah um, i mean so they meet um gosh what's his uh romar they meet romar let's not get to that yet that's the second episode because we still got stuff in this you know the second part you want to talk about romar yet because right. he's in the second part yeah um okay, okay. uh i i will i there is another thing i want to touch on in this episode this this first part they're talking about how like dooku was do was dooku was corrupt and stealing all this stuff 
And then there's this pause, and then Omega goes, but isn't that what we're doing? And there's like, and, and I remember like that, I remember watching that and being like, yeah, that is what they're doing. Uh, so there, and, and Echo's response is, is, of course, the very Echo response is, depends how we use it. Because, you know, under Echo's like way of thinking, I think there would be some moral justification for that because they're kind of reverse Robin Hooding it back to the people who need the most help anyway. But, but, but under Hunter's, um, under Hunter's like way of doing it, it reminds me, here we go, Indiana Jones again, um, in the Dial of Destiny trailer where, where in the new um, bad guy, Voller, played by Mads Mikkelsen, actually, um, says to Indiana Jones, uh, I forget the exact exchange, but it's, um, you stole it. Uh, then you stole it. And then, um, Phoebe Waller-Bridge's character, uh, Helena goes, then I stole it. It's called capitalism. Um, where, you know, if it was just for hunters, like, like, if it was just to settle down and all that kind of stuff, how is, how are they any better than Dooku? I mean, yeah. I'm not saying they're as bad as Dooku because he, obviously he did this on such a large scale and on such a ruthless. But like, how are they? How are they morally justified in doing that? Yeah, but I mean, I mean, they're really not when you think about it. You know, they are stealing. I mean, you could say they're they're stealing from. Uh, they're stealing from Dooku, but. They're also stealing from everyone Dooku stole from. You know, they're not trying. Yeah. To, they're not trying to to get that money and that wealth back to who it was taken from originally. They're not trying to get it back to all the different planets and communities. They're trying to take it for themselves, and they're they're being directed by Sid to take yeah. it. Whether and I think if, if they, they go hunters route, it, if they go hunters route, if they go Echoes routes, then. Yeah, if they go Echo's route and they use it to try and fight the Empire, that's one thing. I think that is more justified. But just taking it for themselves, like that is a yeah. good. You know, and we Romar says, and and it, it, I know we're not there yet, but it is it is relevant here. Romar says when when he hears them talking about the the treasure, he says, you know, maybe you're not as uh, what, what does he say? Maybe you're not as um different from the other clones as you think you are. Something to that effect, you know. Yeah, that's specifically about the mission, but I get your point. Um, yeah, absolutely. It it it's you know, yeah. I I really like this like this idea of how again again how much is the treasure worth? Like obviously you, you they know what it'll sell for, but like how much is the treasure worth for them? Are they willing to like like did do they need this? Or are other things more important? And we'll obviously get to that answer at the end of the um episode. Um but uh I will say this. This is this is a cool detail. Um uh, when they, when Hunter and Wrecker are making their way down, um, Castle Sereno, there's that panning shot where they get to the throne room, which is, like, I feel like exactly identical to a panning shot where, like, from the Clone Wars, where Dooku's talking to one of his henchmen about something. I or hologram. And, I like, to see, like, a, a flipped version of that, where we're panning down there and we expect to see Dooku, but we don't, because yeah. obviously he's dead, that's fantastic. I love that so much. Love that they, I love that they just—they just so happen to end up in. Uh, it just so happened to end up in Kenobi's throne room. I do love that they. I do love that they go to Count Dooku's throne room and are kind of fighting there, and you know the the yeah. the, the clones or the Imperial clones end up kind of um, ironically destroying what's left of of Dooku's throne room, kind of yeah. try to crash the place. Which is a bit a bit ironic, I think. Yeah. Um, circumstances. I, and I will say this: I remember when I watched the first part of this episode because obviously both parts came out on the same day, 
and I remember that like the box the the at the end very end the crate crashing down and the re-entry thrusters weren't working for a second and I'm like oh no I know what they're gonna do the re-entry thrusters are gonna fail and then we're gonna hear the force theme flourish we're gonna go here dun 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 dun, dun. and who's Sorry. gonna be holding the crate up it's gonna be Gunji because I knew Gunji was gonna be in this season somehow <laughs> and my brain was autofilling the rest of it in. And I'm like, that's how they're going to bring Gunji in. Now, I was about four episodes too early, but they did bring Gunji in. I mean, I've obviously do that from the trailers. Um, but so I just wanted to mention on end on that one. Um, why don't we give our um just general thoughts on the on this one once we get through both parts? Yeah. I mean, I think that an early, uh, not one more thing, one little detail that I noticed the first time that I watched this, and I and I noticed it again this time was Omega does. Omega flinches, before, there's any impact, like right before, right before, they 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 impact in the crate, and I guess this is at the beginning of the next episode, but right before they impact, um in the cargo crate on the ground we do see omega there's a shot of her kind of kind of flinching and bracing a split second before it happens when they're they're inside this dark crate there's no windows there's no way there's no possible way for them to tell exactly when they're going to impact i thought maybe that was an early hint at omega's possible force sensitivity but it was interesting very, I, 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 i'm still not convinced but you know it just be me reading into it too much, but I, I definitely thought there was a little, there was a little possible hint there. They're saying, like, hey, hey, think about this maybe for a little bit. Maybe yeah. I'm still not convinced about Omega being force sensitive, but that's just me. Um, yeah. Um, so and then so so obviously the crate crashes to the ground. Um, I will say this: if I had a nickel. For every time a Star Wars Star Wars hero is um, Star Wars hero is crushed by the uh, treasure they're trying to steal, um, and then died later in the season in the past year of Star Wars, I have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's really weird that it happened twice in one year. Which is the other one? I'm not sure exactly. Who is Nemec in, in Andor. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he dies pretty much as a direct result of getting crushed. Yes, I, I understand that, but they're both crushed by treasure. That is true. That is and there's long-lasting damage. One of them's death, one of them's just injury, but Tech does die later in the season, so... <laughs> it, it's it's really strange that both those things happened in the same year. And what, what, was, what would have been weirder is that Bad Batch was originally scheduled to release alongside Andor, so imagine we saw them closer together. Yeah. That would have been just strange. Two people getting crushed by treasure. Um, I will say, and this sounds this might sound a little sadistic. I wish they did injuries in Star Wars a bit more. Because uh, there, there are impacts on the character that don't mean death. And I think they're a really, really interesting way to grow characters. Or to like have characters out of the picture for a for a few minutes for a for as long as the characters need to, like I just think it's an interesting device that that probably should get used more in Star Wars because you know, because it's not like death where like you know they they have to like if they really want the character back they have to bring them back and then it gets to the whole question like they can recover from injuries you know what I mean yeah I mean I think in I think though especially in Star Wars animation I think all these characters at this point we've pretty much accepted to suspend disbelief that all these characters in the clone wars rebels bad batch what have you are all pretty much semi indestructible and and we routinely see characters go through insane physical trauma that really should be life threatening or at least put you out of commission for a long time and they just dust it off and walk away like i feel like if this was an actual crash everyone in that everyone in that crate would have you know multiple broken bones bruises possibly oh, yeah absolutely final injuries like yeah i just i i just am sick and tired I, of 
and no offense to anybody who believes this, but I'm sick and tired personally of hearing tech is alive theories. No, he's dead. I'm really sorry. It hurt me too. But the man's dead. Yeah. Um Yeah, but he, he what? is yeah. Um uh but uh what was I gonna say? Yeah, but but and then and then yeah, and then we obviously now now if we want to talk about Romar, Romar Adele. We can talk about Romar, who is just such a fascinating character. I I love this character, and I, I love what he represents in the episode, because he is um because he is obviously an original Serenian. He was uh he was he was of the planet long before Dooku. I believe probably was the count of the planet um, himself. Probably his family still was. But um, was was the rulers of Sereno, but but way before um, that, his world directly got involved with um, through probably not much of their own will um, the uh, the separatist alliance. You know, I can't imagine that 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 the Serenians were were thrilled about having all those vulture droids whizzing about, and like they they probably didn't get much of a choice in the matter. Um, yeah. Uh, and I, it, it, it's, 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 it's one of those things like I, I wrote in my notes for this episode, the question of how did the people of Sereno feel about Dooku once his intentions became clear was one I never would have asked, but probably should have asked. Um, it, it, it uh, I, yeah, it, it seems it seems obvious now, but I just never considered it. Um, once upon a time, Dooku would have claimed to be a supporter of people in Romar's situation, but he was the one who ruined that man's life. Yeah. It's the yeah. cruel it's... tragedy of, of, of Dooku. Yeah, I, he kind of, it's interesting, you know, I mean, he's, a, you know, for, for politicians, for leaders especially non-democratically elected leaders it's not all not all that uncommon but you know clay he claims to be you're representing the interests of the common people while at the same time exploiting and and robbing his own people to fund to fund the war and to fund his personal wealth as the the count of sereno and we know we know what dooku's like we knew we know how dooku carries himself i I'm sure he feels it is his divine right, or it is birthright. Odd in Star Wars, it is his birthright to kind of do whatever he wants with Sereno and and his subjects. I think it's. I know. I would. I would like to see Dooku as a character dove into a little bit more. <laughs> what was he like as a count? I think because yeah, I think absolutely. Based, based on what we know about him, you could make the case that maybe he does have kind of some sense of some kind of sense of justice or fairness in a way to an unexpected extent but you could also make the argument that it goes the other way and that he's just totally merciless which this this and, just the latter yeah and i and i think he was a lot more just in his early life but if you look at the people running the separatist alliance and i'm not talking about the separatist senate there were as much figureheads as the imperial senate will end up being um you know, we're talking about the real leaders of the Separatist Alliance. Wat Tamlor, Newt Gunray, Shumai, Pasal Argente, the corporate leaders. I mean, imagine if young Dooku had seen those guys leading the Separatist Alliance. He'd practically throw up. But he handpicked those people. Older Dooku handpicked those people. True. That's true. I mean, he was he was willing to do a favor for New Gunray in order for him to join the Separatist Alliance. The favor failed, but he was willing to do it. Which I have to re reference the infamous um, meme. Uh, that favor, of course, was to send was was to send a guy to send a woman to send a droid to send bugs to go kill Padme. 
Yeah. <laughs> um, brilliant, br- brilliant plan, my guy. Brilliant, brilliant plan. Um. Uh. So yeah, no, no, Roar is just such an interesting character. Um. Uh, and I love like the the little bit of like stumble he gives uh Tech, where Tech goes, I never thought of that. Um, and, uh, you know, all this stuff is taking place between people with their own societies and lives, and sometimes in the grandiosity of Star Wars, which, which I love, like, which, which, you know, I'll, I'll admit I love more than most people probably do, um, we forget about just, like, the people impacted by all this stuff, and I think Romar was very important to see just the yeah. people. Yeah, absolutely. I, I absolutely agree. I really like Ramar as the character. I think his presence in this episode is great. It's interesting. I think that he doesn't want, he doesn't care about getting the treasure back. He's kind well, of just disgusted. He's so disgusted by the whole thing and by what Count Dooku's done and then by what the Empire's done. And I guess by how many times that he's been screwed over by whatever government's in power that he just wants to wash his hands of the whole thing. That was interesting to me. Yeah. He's like, let them. Yeah, but I, I think I he just feels like the bad blood is too old now. I, yeah, I, like, like, like he's like just just not worth it anymore. Um, which is a horrible thing to think, but you know I understand why. Um, I also really like though. I also really like his his little conversation with. I can't remember whether it's I think it's Echo or Tech, but he he when he has the um his um his Serenian like um data bank of Serenian culture, which I guess the implication is it's kind of being wiped out or it's under threat because of the Empire coming in and trying to crush every world that was important to the separatists as they are oft want to do. Someone says, interest, I, 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 yeah, it's tech, right? It's tech says, oh, vault of separatist culture. Fascinating. And he's not separatist. Says, no. Serenian. Yeah, not separatist, Serenian. And tech says, oh, I never thought of it like that before. And he goes, yeah. exactly. And I, 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 mean, I think that's a great moment. Yeah. Kind of moving in a, in a, it's a subtle way, just showing that that you're moving on. You know, adapt or die, they have to move out of the, clone wars mentality into something else it's also just cool to see you know for romar what his character brings what his character brings in terms of 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 depth and development to the batch so i was i was yeah. I was, a little, was a fan of that little moment and then we have our indiana jones moment here where it's where where omega's needs to decide whether she values her own life or the life of the tread or 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 the treasure, and whether she's willing to further risk her own life for the treasure. It's a direct parallel. I, I'm not sure how intentional this was, but it is a parallel of uh, Indiana Jones and Henry Jones Sr. In at the end of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Um, there's Echo even says the same line that Sean Connery says is Henry Jones Sr. in that, let it go, let it go, Indy, let it go. Um, uh, and, you know, not to get too savvy, but, like, you know, the whole, like, the treasure is the friends we made along the way, and the family is the real treasure idea. Um, I also like the additional aspect that they put in there. I'm not sure, like, I like it. I'm not sure if it, it worked exactly, but I, I like how they tried to do it, which is the idea of, like, there's that conversation between Hunter and Echo that Omega overhears at the beginning of the episode, where... Uh, we're at the beginning of the first episode where basically they're saying that the life they have is that way because they rescued Omega um, is one of the things that Echo says. But he expands on that by saying, and 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 we need to keep doing stuff like that. But Omega, all Omega hears is the first part. And I think that she thinks that by getting the treasure that she can finally prove her worth in the squad to them. Now, what she doesn't know is that she's already proven herself worthy tr- time and time again by them. But I, I think I, I think it's this this thing that slips out 
and the, then Omega takes the wrong way from Echo. Um, and the let it go is not only a, like, come on, save yourself, but also, I value you. You've proven yourself to me. Forget the... Friggin' forget the, um... Forget the treasure. Forget the treasure. You've proven yourself to us. We'll be fine without it. No, yeah, I, 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 I think, I think you're absolutely right because we, we, we see why. Throughout this episode, it's kind of frustrating to watch or a little bit kind of, it's a little bit mystifying. You know, why is Omega so dead set on getting the treasure? Also, to take a take a shot every time, take a shot every time Omega says the word treasure, and it sounds yep. funny. Um, but yeah, it's it, it's another moment. It's another moment like that, like we get in season one of kind of moving through. It's another pivot point for Omega for her relationship with the batch where they kind of. And I, I think symbol, I think in a literal sense, it's I mean, I mean, I mean, in a literal in a literal sense, Echo is just saying, Omega, oh we got to get the hell out of here. But like you said, symbolically, it does kind of represent. He's saying, look, treasure or not, like, you don't have to compensate. You don't have to compensate your place here. Like, you belong. You're still with one me. of us. No Basically, matter you're what. One of us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and then, unless you got anything else, I think we should get to the final part of the episode, which is, sir, I will not falsify an, an official report. I understand. Oh, yeah. I will. Boom. I remember when I saw that moment the first time and my jaw dropped to the floor. I'm like, oh my god, the Empire is really striking back. This this definitely kicks this really kicks the stakes up. This really kicks up the stakes for um for Rampart because before this yeah. he is kind of just I mean, he's he's the armchair admiral, you know. He's he doesn't really do anything beyond just you know give give out orders and kind of you know do a little bit of politicking here and there. But all of a sudden, that's our see... name. That's our title for this episode, by the way. You're not what? going to change that for me. The armchair admiral. <laughs> okay, fair enough. I like I it's catchy. It's catchy. Yeah. Um, either that or I'll... space U hauls. Spacey, I like space. Spacey U hauls is pretty great. Pretty great as well. Um, but um, all of a sudden, he kind of gets some some danger and some 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 credibility, you know. Um, and at, watching this, I remember for the first time, I was really viscerally angry watching um, watching Rampart execute. What's his close name? I can't remember. Who is it? Oh, Wilco. Yeah. Oh, Wilco. Also, that's funny because of the band Wilco. Yeah. Shout out to one of my favorite bands. Funny coincidence or reference? Pro it's got to be I a reference. I think it's probably. I don't know. So either so either so either someone making the Bad Batch really likes Wilco or really dislikes Wilco. <laughs> yeah, either one. Which, but Wilco. You know, we see you know a, a dedicated clone. You know a a. a we know who the clones are. We know they're 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 for the most part with the with the with the obvious couple of it, you know, with the obvious occasional exception, <clears throat> Fox, <clears throat> Slick. The clones are, you know, they're they're big hearted, they're good hearted, they're brave, they're capable, they're hard working, um with with what they're given and they're kind of they're dealt a pretty crappy hand. But they they really do the best with what they've got, a lot of the time. And we see, all of a sudden, Rampart decides that he takes it upon himself to execute a clone for one of the stupidest reasons ever. Rampart, this you know, self-absorbed, very kind of selfish, conniving, um, you know, armchair like political appointee, basically. Like we yeah. haven't seen 
work his way up in the ranks for any reason other than his political kind of his political maneuvering basically and that's that all of a sudden kind of i think kicks up the stakes for rampart as a villain because now he's not just oh he's that he's that like annoying guy all of a sudden he has credibility of, oh he's willing to take a life to get where yeah. he needs to be and to keep him in his in his power <laughs> Yeah, so and that that that's for me. Yeah, the escalation of the stakes that the empire is more ruthless now, generally, and I think that's what we're going to get. Obviously, with the downfall of Rampart very shortly as well, but also with his replacement as the main villain of the uh, series, Doctor Hemlock. Doctor Hemlock is ridiculously ruthless. Ruthless. He's almost cartoonishly ruthless. Oh yeah. Um. And or and, and same with that guy from the outpost. Uh what the fuck is that guy? Um uh what's that guy? The the guy from the outpost. You know who I'm talking about, the colonel from the outpost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know the the, the yeah, I know what you're talking about. I know you're Vogel, talking. I think is his name. Is his name Vogel? Nolan. Nolan, Lieutenant Nolan. That guy, Lieutenant Nolan. Lieutenant Nolan is is his name. Uh, yeah. Now I'm completely forgetting my point. Um. Oh yeah, they're 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 getting more and more ruthless and getting more and more impersonal as the empire grows in their power and bureaucracies. Um. Yeah. What are your overall thoughts about this two part episode? You know, I think. Once again, I can't believe I'm saying this yet again, but just like season one of The Bad Batch, I think it gets better on the rewatch. I really do. I thought that the first episode, I think, had its moments. It wasn't the best. I thought The Spoils of War was all right. I thought it kind of, it, 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 it's the show, it feels like the show is kind of taking some time to find its voice and find its footing, but we have some good moments in there for sure, you know. I think um, the discussions with, with Sid are really good. Um, I think the, it's very inconsequential, but the, the crab chase is great just for the, the sheer musical value of it all. And then I think in the solitary clone, it re- the story really kind of picks up, you know, or sorry, not the solitary clone, uh, the ruins, ruins of, of war. war. With the ruins of war, I think the story really picks up. I think, um, you know, seeing the bombarded city up close, you know, um, I'm not a huge fan of the uh, the B plot of of Wrecker and and um and Hunter in this one. I think it's it's a lot of action. It's it's very exciting, but. There's not really a lot of um, it doesn't really have a backbone in terms of the story, but I, I think overall these are two pretty pretty good episodes. I'd say Spoils of War for me is like I'm 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 positive on the Spoils of War. I'm quite positive on Ruins of War. I think um, thematically they do a really good job of kind of opening up these characters more, building on the themes of you know adapting, surviving. The, the choices that must be made, you know, working with Sid, not working with Sid, whether to hide, whether to fight. I think it does a very good job of kind of picking up where the last season left off. Also with Omega as her role with the the batch is kind of emergent and always always kind of always kind of changing and under a little bit of tension. I think these episodes, the moments when they focus on these themes are the best and the times when these themes are kind of lost and out of focus i think the show tends to drag a little bit more but overall these are two really good episodes i really like romar and everything that he brings in the second episode so overall i think these are very very respectable it's a very respectable start to the season these are these are good episodes yeah i i like i like both of these episodes too um i think i'm i might be a bit more positive on them than uh than jacob are i think that um i i i actually wish we had gotten a little bit more about dooku just himself and the legacy that that man specifically left um maybe that's just because we're coming off of uh tales of the jedi um that i wanted that but um 
I, I but mostly I really did like I think they were a great introduction back into the world of the Bad Batch after not being there for a while. I think they set up the stakes of the season really well. Um and it's really crazy to me that as good as these episodes are, that they're not in my top five of the season. Like that's the bar for this season, is that these episodes are fantastic. And combined, they're not in my top five. Um of the season, which is crazy to say out loud. But it's true. Um, weird segue. You know what isn't my top five episodes of the Bad Batch season two? The Solitary Clone. Mm. The Solitary Clone is a fucking masterpiece. <laughs> I can't like the Solitary Clone took crosshair to me from a character that I was vaguely interested in into a character that I'm incredibly invested in now. Um, do you want to get to the solitary clone? You got anything else to say about the premiere? No, I'm I'm ready for uh yeah. I'm ready All for right. uh for the solitary clone. Let's All uh, right, let's do this. Feel very strongly about it. So uh this episode's this episode's that. fucking beautiful. Um, first off, yeah, first off, it is literally beautiful. I know I yeah. sound like a broken record, but the planet of Death Six is very cool, visually stunning. I think the the big the big citadel, the palace surrounded by the fields, it's it's all gorgeous. It's all absolutely gorgeous, and that never hurts when yeah, when an absolutely. episode has a backdrop that could never hurt. Yeah, um, we. One of the things I want to first mention is that we have this continuing thread that was started in Legends, and we've seen some stuff in uh, canon uh, about this, but mostly it's been a Legends idea that there were still a lot of Separatist holdouts after the Clone War that there, that weren't decimated during the time of Order 66 that the Empire had to go and sweep up later. And the Desix is one of them, and we know there are other ones. Um, we know the um, we know the Andor's separatist leanings um, in that show. We also know that one of the major rebel cells um, uh, moving on is Anto Krieger, who is a former separatist. Um, we know that they're out there, but this is our best look at one of them right now with Tony Ames and the people of Desix. Um, and uh, I think the character of Tony Ames is so fascinating. Um, and I, I think that she does a lot. She put, proves the great foil for both Crosshair and Cody in this episode. Um, uh, but let's, let's, I want to talk about first, how long were you stranded on that Kaminoan platform before being recovered? 32 rotations. Hmm. Now. All that time. Left for dead, and yet you still came back. There's this great tug of war that's being played with Crosshair this season that I makes me appreciate him so much, and I think both of his set, both of the Crosshair centric episodes this season, this and the Outpost, are really great character studies in how, because I think deep down Crosshair knows that the Empire's bad news. I don't think Crosshair likes the Empire deep down. But I think it's it's still about safety for him. I think it's still about fear. And I think that he... He likes keeping his head down. And just, you know, good soldiers, followers. And that's where he's most comfortable. But, you know, he's realizing... he's He, he is really realizing that they're, start, they're, that they're treating him like trash. Because they are. And it's it's incredibly it's 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 incredibly it's great to have this tug of war and this push and pull, and I love these episodes where you know the power is not in the few words that they say, but in the dozens of words and dozens of sentences that they don't that we can feel so much subtext going on behind every word that's spoken. Um, and behind every choice that's being made, writing and directing-wise, 
shout out to Saul Ruiz, who directed this episode, and Amanda Rose Munoz, who wrote this episode. Again, I think this is one of the best written episodes of Star Wars um, animated television I've ever seen. Um, like, dear God. Um, I remember, again, I remember watching this episode for the first time. And after I turned it off, I just sat with it for a second. I'm like, this is how the season's going to go. This is the way we're, th- th- this is episode three and we're getting this hard hitting episode. Yeah, as, as far as the ending goes, this one is is very hard hitting. I think, um, you know, especially with the reveal that Tony Ames knew Mina Bonteri and worked together on the peace bill that that Palpatine um or the, the treaty that Palpatine ended up rejecting I think it kind of puts this moment into focus again as kind of the the empire trying to kill off any possibility that the truth could get out there you know and I think also, obviously, you know, the, just the the overwhelming sense of one era is ending and another has begun, I would say. Yeah, no, I, I, I like the, um, I call it Darth Plagueis effect, where, you know, th- this idea that it's, it's happening just off screen. Um, you know what I mean? The, the, like, like that Ames was somewhere just off screen during Heroes on both sides. Um, yeah, sure. And, th- and that and that she was instrumental, as was Bonteri, to that act. Um, and it makes a lot of sense why she beats, but why she reject any idea of peace after the subsequent bombing of Coruscant that was blamed on the separatists, but she had no knowledge of. Um, and then the murder of uh, the murder of Bonteri by what she was probably told were Republic troops, even though they were separatist assassins. Um, Yeah. You know, it makes sense why she'd be so skeptical of peace. Um, And and again, this is tragedy. She was buying what Dooku was selling, and what what Dooku was selling on the outside was a great idea. That's the other thing. Like, like, like it's one of those, it's one of those things, again, where where yeah. the people of the separatist alliance actually had some pretty good ideas it was just their leadership that was hopelessly corrupt and just really good at hiding it um and um one of the things i love the most about this episode just adding on to that idea is that this episode feels like a warped episode of the clone wars mm, it feels was- like an episode of the clone wars but something just isn't right and it's not right because of course the separatists are looking more like the good guys now, and the republic are looking more like the bad guys. But it's shot and framed like it's a TCW episode, and the clones are the good guys, and the separatists are the bad guys. And that's because we know Cody and Crosshair, and we instinctively want to root for them. Yeah, we have this this um, continued kind of the conceit very this very familiar conceit and setup from the clone wars of the clones fighting their way through droids outnumbered outgunned but certainly not outspirited but i think in a way this kind of does set us up for crosshair to be a protagonist in this episode we're set up i i think i felt like even though he was still even though he's working for the empire even though he you know executes he cold-bloodedly executes um, Tawny Ames after she throws down her weapons. I think it kind of sets us up to root for him more as a bit of a protagonist in this episode because we kind of, we've seen a bit more of the human side of Crosshair in some of those moments, some of the yeah. moments of Bad Batch season one. And then obviously that continues the Bad Batch season two. We see him like this is after we start to see what he endures at the hands of the empire and that makes us feel really bad for him. that makes yeah, us yeah and 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 help. the cracks are forming and the cracks are forming in him that's that's beginning to question something um we'll go to that Cody line that he says that's obviously in the trailer that was in the trailer i remember this very well um for the season uh rumors are more and more clones have been questioning the order and yeah. This is a really interesting effect that I never thought about 
until the Bad Batch brought it up again, like the separate, what, like the stuff about uh, Serena. But yeah, the idea that the inhibitor chips' effects are only temporary, and that they might be wearing off for some clone troopers, is just a really fascinating idea. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that I know you've expressed expressed issues with the inhibitor chips before. Um, and I'm not saying that this fixes it's not, it's that. Not, to clarify, it's not that I have issue. It's not that I ha- take issue with the inhibitor chips so much as I think that the story could, it ha- it could have been, it could have been even harder hitting if it didn't have the inhibitor chips as part of the story. Yeah. So all- no, I, I I understand, but I I think that 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 this this threads an interesting middle ground where they did this thing. But now it's starting to wear off of them months, maybe even a year later. Um, yeah. And they're looking around saying, holy shit, what have I gotten myself into? Um, and of course, that happens with Cody in this episode. Yeah. Um, this, and- is not, this is not just, and, and Eli, I want to say this is not just like a headcanon thing, like in the Kanan in the Kanan comics, like we've already seen, like there there already is in canon clones who even pretty directly after Order 66, like in a matter of of, of weeks or days, they're kind of they kind of are overcome certain clones are overcome with with um grief and and doubt about what they've done and and actually yeah, but like, like the Empire, like the Empire will say this up until Cody just says that in the trailer. I thought that cases like Styles and Gray in the Kanan comic, or like um, friggin' um, Hauser in season one of The Bad Batch, or even Rex in The Clone Wars, I thought those were anomalies. I thought those were the exceptions to the rules. I didn't think that something larger was happening. And again, again, I think the point is neither did the Empire um, until Hmm. now. But the idea that the, 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 that it was that the dark side and that Sidious and Dooku, when designing these inhibitor chips, which makes a lot of sense, did consider the long term. And ultimately, I don't think they're going to need to because they're going to have a way that more than enough uh, TK and stormtroopers to deal with any sort of clone insurgency, which I think might be happening in season three now. Um. Mm. Yeah. But like, especially with that rogue clone network um that we see forming at the end of season two of the Bad Batch. Um, but but I think that what was I gonna say? I think that it 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 does seem more like a like you know, it's popping up with dozens of clones. And I know there are millions and millions of clones that they made, but it's 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 getting to be a larger and larger percentage of these clones, and I'm now thinking about like you know, what if it was only supposed to last for a short time and they just didn't realize that for some reason, um, or they didn't care. Yeah. Uh, and now they're having to deal with the consequences of their own actions or inactions. We don't quite know, but the idea of more and more clones questioning the order and more and more clones. Proving disloyal to the Empire now is a really interesting idea and something that that I just never considered on as large of a scale as um as it is happening right now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um yeah, that's that's really um I I, I love that too. Um, let's see, um, a couple of smaller notes, um, about, like, the middle of the episode, which is just a lot of action, and it's just fun, it's just fun, it's, again, it feels like a Lost Clone Wars episode, um, we have Battle Droid Humor back, that doesn't look good, yeah, for them. <laughs> I love the Battle Droid, can we, can we get it, can we get a round of applause for the, the, uh, the B1s high-fiving? Good shot. Hell uh, Yeah. Come on. Uh, I also <laughs> love, um, yeah, again, the shit that Crosshair does in this episode. Shooting a blaster bolt into the cannon of an AAT. Yeah. 
not to mention all that that stuff near at the end when they're climbing up the tower where he has the I was gonna say the, the mirror part. shot is one of the coolest things I've witnessed in any piece of Star Wars media ever, period. The double mirror shot, the The, the mirror the, shot is is maybe one of the coolest things I've ever seen a Star Wars so character do. Let's get this let's get this straight. He shoots a laser, he shoots his blaster, hits it on he has these like little mirror pucks, right? Off one of the mirror pucks, off another one that was thrown into the air seconds before, and then somehow his blaster bolt magically ricochets off three different battle droids, killing all of them. Well, it before. ricochets off a few more mirror pucks. No, it's just two. It's just two? It's it's two. It's the one on the wall, and then the one that he has. Um, I thought he had placed a few more on the wall. It's the one. No, it's the one on the wall. The one he. Well, he he places them on the wall multiple times, but in the final shot, it's the one. He, it's the one on the wall, then the one that he has Cody throw, and then it hits like three battle droids before finally exploding mm-hmm. off the freaking super tactical droid or the the tactical, the, the tactical droid. droid. Yeah. What the, the fuck was then, that? All I will say, all I will say is suspend disbelief. <laughs> I even, don't care. Even Look for, at that. It's so it, fucking cool. I don't know. I, I I get that Star Wars follows the rule of cool, but even for even for Star Wars, I felt like that was really that that kind of stepped over the line for me. Like that was up there with He's a part of the Bad Batch. That's what he does. That was I know, but for me personally, I was like, that that's like the new saber copters. Like just gotta just don't you can't think about it too hard or you can't think about it too hard or it falls yeah apart. i guess i don't have any problem with saber copters i think that saber copters like i think the saber copters are fucking hilarious my 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 point my thing with the saber copters is just apparently the explanation is there's like repulsors in the hilt of the lightsaber in which case why do you need to have the blade on then it's just dangerous but you know what again like i said if you don't like it don't think about it it's the yeah. it's just a way for it to not be upsetting because when you start to think about it you're like holy shit this makes no sense unless you like it in which case more power to you because it is pretty badass yeah um <laughs> kind of- i i fucking love the mirror shot i love the mirror shot so much um yeah and then of course we have um uh yeah and then and then i i love also that after crosshair pulls the trigger on um on Ames. We get the we get what I call the um oh shit we're in danger based from. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> like yeah. that that like that 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 bass drum that sounds in the bad batch whenever we know holy shit things are getting intense. Yeah. I mean Kevin Kiner they they they, they started using that that like kind of big rattly pulsing bass thing in uh siege of mandalore and they have not they have not let up since nope and I'm, it gets me every time it's tasty it's great it, it, it's great it's fantastic um yeah and then we have and then of course we have um cody and uh crosshairs uh chat after they get back from desix you know what makes us different from battle droids we make our own decision our own choices and we have to live with them too I think that's the moment. I mean, obviously for Cody, because he goes AWOL shortly. He deserts shortly after. But for Crosshair, that's the moment, I think. Because we see him kind of, we see it on his face. We see him processing, oh, wow. A clone like me, a soldier who I really respect, has decided, has kind of said, hey, there's more to being a soldier than just following order orders and being as loyal as possible because that's what crosshair especially a lot of the clones but crosshair especially it's very evident i mean he he pretty much says as much numerous times he really hangs his hat on being a real loyal model soldier being real loyal that's something that he really takes serious and it's his it's one of the most important parts of his identity so important that it's it's more important than his identity is part of the bad batch as sorry as a family member with the rest of the batch i mean he 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 chooses the empire over them in season one um so i think this is where we see that start to move in the other direction a little bit yeah absolutely 
Um, and then, of course, we have our um, impactful final line in this episode. Funny, is it, how these clones around you keep disappearing? And I'm like, you know what, Rampart, it is funny. It's almost like the clones around Crosshair are seeing what his blind loyalty to the Empire is making him into and getting out of the terrible system while you can. Maybe yeah. I'm just spitballing, though. I don't know. That that might just be... <laughs> um yeah if you, if you haven't if you don't have anything else if you do tell me but i, I want to share my overall thoughts on this yeah go for it go right ahead a fucking brutal character study on crosshair um making him from a character that i liked into a character that i loved um amanda rose munoz and saul ruiz killed this episode one of my favorite episodes of the season if not of star wars television ever uh i i i don't i can't find a single thing i hate about this episode because it just worked that much for me um fucking loved it top five episodes of the season probably top 10 episodes of the show just in general yeah i i really i i enjoyed this episode i think not as much as you but again i i definitely thought this was one of the better episodes of this of this season and of the Bad Batch, for sure. I thought the Planet Desix was a great, it was an amazing, it was an amazing setting. Um, I think this did a lot for setting up, um, this, you know, this really sets up um, Crosshair's arc. Um, yeah, I, th I think it's a great episode as well. I think I'm torn between whether I like this one or Ruins of War better. I am going to go with the Solitary Clone, but I think by a, by a much narrower margin than you would say. Yeah, I was gonna say I, I love the the two part premiere. I really do, but the solitary clone is just is is miles above. Like I, it it was it's probably like maybe maybe reunion. It's a tough like between the stuff we've watched so far, reunion and and solitary clone are vying for the top. But that's gonna change once we get to the mid season um arc of this season because that that one clone conspiracy truth and consequences dear god love those so much yeah. um uh but yeah i think that's gonna be it for this episode of star wars in the galaxy um before we end i just wanted to um say uh a happy birthday to my co-host right over here jacob jacob is having his birthday the day after we record this episode a few days before um this comes out um so if you're on uh if you're on Twitter, uh, tag our show um, tomorrow when it comes out. I'll share all the messages um, to him. He's not on uh, social media like um, I am. But yeah, happy birthday, Jacob. Um, I hope you Thank have a great day tomorrow. Uh, and thanks for all you've done for the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, but in the meantime, next week, next week, we're going to be chugging along as usual. Three more episodes of Bad Batch Season 2. Faster. Tribe, and I missed the middle one. Oh, uh, I will, I will, uh, to all my Taylor Swift fans, best believe I'm still entombed, uh, is how I used to say it. Faster entombed and tribe next week, four, five, and six of the Bad Batch. Uh, the Bad Batch is going on some side missions, baby. We love our side missions. I love two of the three of the side missions. Uh, spoiler alert. Uh, but anyway. Uh, in the meantime, you can follow us on Twitter at New Galaxy Pod, at Star Wars New Galaxy on Instagram. You can listen to us, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, wherever you listen to your podcasts, we will be there. Uh, if, uh, if we're not, email us, uh, as well as with hot takes, trivia, any message you want for the show, galaxy at gmail.com. Um, uh, uh, watch our spinoff show, Epic Confrontations. I think I'm crossing my fingers. We might have a record date tomorrow. I'm crossing my fingers for EC, uh, for uh, for Ryan's versus Cable. I'm crossing my fingers. Um, so everybody send me your good auras on that one. Hopefully by the time this comes out, we will have released it because I want to release that as soon as we can. Um, but in the meantime, may the force be with you. Always. Always. <laughs>